Hey everybody, it's David or Jabian again, of course. Uh, it's uh, August the 19th. We're ready for our last review. And as I said last week, uh, it's always, of course, been Rosemary Rumley for as long as we can remember. Now, it just looks like I have the same shirt on, but I happen to own a lot of shirts of the same type. So don't get confused. Um, tonight, instead of Richard, Amy Berry is going to introduce Rosemary. And again, as I held up last week, it's going to be the History of the World in Six Glasses. But I'm going to turn this over to, to Amy to uh, welcome you all and, and introduce our speaker. And I'll see you at the end. Hello and welcome. I'm Amy Berry, the Library Coordinator for Highland Park United Methodist Church. I prepared an introduction of our distinguished and revered book reviewer a while back. And although she's racked up hundreds of book reviews since then, the sentiment and the facts remain true. She's simply awesome. In fact, the Rejabian Committee and our audience want her as the Rejabian season closer every year. So we're absolutely thrilled that she was willing to return for that role this year, even as we switched to this new virtual format. So, with great affection and enthusiasm, I want to present this tribute to and introduction of this evening's presenter. Rosemary Rumbly, Rosemary Rumbly, the chant goes through the year. She is wanted by all the people. They demand that she appear. Well, no wonder. Entertaining and exciting, she serves up wisdom laced with fun. This book reviewer sure delivers a grand time for everyone. An actress on stage and screen, she's thrilled both young and old. With her humor as her hallmark, she's Texas speaker gold. With her communications doctorate, she's a scholar through and through. A historian and an author, she's a businesswoman too. All around the world, she's traveled, also taught at DBU. Rosemary even plays piano. There's nothing she can't do. Dallas is proud to claim her. And now, Rajabian is blessed to welcome back Ms. Rumbly, beloved speaker and our guest. Hi, everybody. I'm doing this presentation uh, with... Uh, without an audience, so I'll miss your laughter. And then I'm sitting down, something I've never done to speak. But we'll have a great time. Now, I'm going to begin with a story that has nothing to do with the review because this is a godly story. God is behind this story. Now, I've always been busy speaking. I'm not so much now. So I decided to have my cataracts removed from both eyes, and they were, they were removed, and I can see. That was a success. Then I've had a spot on my face for about five years, and I just put makeup on it and ignore it and forget it. And my daughter said, Mother, you've got to have the spot removed. So I went to a dermatologist, beautiful woman, by the name of Z-E-I-K-O-S, Zykus, Dr. Zykus. And I showed her the spot. She said, we'll get rid of it. And she did. That was on uh, a Thursday, two weeks ago. Dr. Zykus, spot removed, big bandage on the side of my face. Well, the next day, I was going to Denison, Texas, to speak. And um, the lady that called me had a 903 phone number because she lived in Denison. She called and said, will you come up to Denison to speak? We are going to wear masks. We're going to social distance, but we want you. Fine. Great. I'll be there. And I told her, do not turn off your cell phone until you see me. Well, that Friday after the surgery, Thursday, I drove to Denison. I get to the parking lot of St. Luke's Episcopal Church. I decide I'm in the wrong par parking lot, so I'll call the lady and tell her that I'm there, but I'm in the wrong parking lot. Could she direct me? I call her at 903 number, and she doesn't answer. 
So I'm thinking, well, she's in the church. She'll eventually see that I'd called and she'll call me. So I will stay in the car and wait for my call. One minute later, a 903 number comes up on my cell phone. She's calling and I say, I'm here, I'm here, don't worry, don't worry, I'm here. And this voice says, well, I'm so glad. And I thought, that's not the lady that called me, but she's on a 903 number. And I said, who are you? Who is this? It's Dr. Zykus. I'm asking how, calling to see how you are. And I said, well, I'm great. I'm in Denison. And she said, I was born and reared in Denison. And I'm in Denison today because I have a practice in Denison on Fridays. I said, well, I'm in Denison at St. Paul's uh, Episcopal Church. She said, that's where my brother went to school. I said, you're in Denison. I'll go in and tell all of the ladies all about you. So I go in with this huge bandage on the side of my face to tell about my face and Dr. Zykus and the lady that, was, that I called said, oh, I'm sorry I didn't answer the phone. I said, I'm glad you didn't. I've got a story to tell now. And I began to tell of Dr. Zykus. Everybody knew her. They either taught her. Her mother was a pediatrician. Her father is a dermatologist in Denison, and she practices with him on Friday. And several, several of the ladies said, now see this spot, you can barely see it, but she removed a spot from my face about two years ago. Now tell me God wasn't in that scene. Now for the review. I'm sorry, I can't hear your laughter. Uh, the review. Now this book. The story of the history, rather, the history of the world in six glasses by Tom Standage. I discovered this book. It's a little paperback book by the cash register. I live in the past. I call them cash registers. There at Barnes & Noble. The history of the world through six glasses. And I bought the book, delightful little book, all about six glasses, a glass of beer, wine, spirits, coffee, tea, and soda pop. Now I'm taking a chance with this book. I told Richard, now this book isn't very, uh, well, what, scholarly, I guess, but it's lots of fun with lots of information. And um, Richard said, well, we have a rather heavy schedule, so that'll be fine. Go on with it. I said, in spite of the fact that I'm a Baptist and I'm going to talk about liquor, all of us know the joke, Protestants do not uh, recognize the Pope as the head of the church. Jewish folk do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And Baptists do not recognize each other in liquor stores. Now we'll move on. It's a great little history book. And we'll start with beer. Who made the first beer? Why beer? What's beer? I hope you'll feel free to have a beer while I'm telling the story of beer. It starts with Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah were chosen by God to have uh, uh, their people, the people of Israel. And uh, Sarah and Abraham, eventually lots of sin on the part of Sarah, but nevertheless, uh, Abraham and Sarah have the child Isaac, who marries Rebekah, who has the twins, uh, Esau and Jacob. Esau sells his birthright, and we have Jacob. Jacob marries Rachel. Rachel has, well, and two other wives. They're not mentioned a lot, but nevertheless, Jacob has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. There they are, the 12 children of Jacob. Now, one of those kids was special to Jacob. Now that's a sin. You're not supposed to like one kid more than the other. But he loved Joseph. And he gave Joseph a cute little coat, 
of many colors because he liked him the best. He loved him uh, the best of the boys. Now, if you haven't seen Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, that musical, I advise you to see it. It's a great little show. It stays right with the scripture, right with the Bible. The funniest part is Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh in that show is Elvis. Nevertheless, <laughs> Pharaoh is head of Egypt. And the boys, the 11 brothers, hating Joseph, sell him into slavery to the Egyptians. And there is Joseph in Egypt, ruled by Pharaoh. Well, God blesses Joseph with the ability to interpret dreams. Pharaoh dreams. Joseph interprets. Pharaoh, there's going to be a famine. You're going to have to save up wheat. Put that wheat away. Put it in barns. Keep the wheat. There's going to be a famine. And Pharaoh does just that and Egypt is saved from the famine because of Joseph. Now we've got all this wheat stacked up in these barns there in Egypt. Do you, would you believe? Now this isn't in the Bible, but it's true. A fungus gets into that wheat. Now that fungus changes that wheat a bit. Uh, that fungus we know today as yeast. We call it yeast. And that fungus created first risen bread. See, they had unleavened bread. It didn't rise. But with this fungus on this wheat, they baked this bread and whoop, it rose. And the chapter says, first we have the bread, then we have the beer. So from that yeast that was on that wheat, in Egypt, beer came to be. Now how? Well, nobody wrote it down. Somebody just came up with a little drink and everybody kind of loved it and it made them feel a little better. And there you have it, the invention of beer in Egypt. And there, Joseph, of course, had his brothers come and um, all of the children of Israel lived happily ever after there in Egypt. Now that's the end of the book of Genesis. And I really should end at that point too and go on to the next drink, except I want to talk about beer just a little bit more. But I always love to preach this lesson about Pharaoh and the children of Israel living so beautifully in Egypt. Pharaoh loved them, took care of them. End of Genesis. But there is a verse in Exodus that is a great teaching verse, and that's Exodus 1, 8, which says, and Pharaoh knew not Joseph. See, they changed Pharaohs. And that next Pharaoh did not like the children of Israel. And of course, Moses was called to lead the children of Israel out of the hands of that new Pharaoh. That is such an important lesson. Because so many people, including me, including you, and lots of people, everything is going just beautifully, and suddenly there's a new Pharaoh, and it screws up the whole thing. I've sent that verse to so many people. We were just doing really well, and then they brought in this new man. I said, a new Pharaoh, huh? That's right. Everything was just fine until we changed principles. I've had teachers say that, new Pharaoh. Well, we got a new preacher at our church, a new Pharaoh. I, I've belabored this enough, so we'll move on. But that's a great lesson in Exodus. But we'll leave the children of Israel there in Egypt with their grain, their bread that's risen, and their beer. Now, the beer went on to Pal Palestine, to the children of Israel. See, they began to make this drink, and everybody liked it. And it went on to the Greeks. And it went on to the Romans. See, it didn't do it overnight, of course, but as time moved on, this beer and the recipe changed whatsoever. But its main, see, it's got to have uh, grain and yeast. And um, it can have different um, uh, formulas, different recipes. But it grew and developed. And the greatest 
beer makers today are the uh, Czechs, uh, the old Bohemians, the Bohemian beer and the Czechs. Uh, you usually think of beer with the Germans. Uh, Germans love beer, they do. Uh, and uh, if you've ever been to Heidelberg, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm German on both sides. And people said, you can't be German, Rosemary. You're too funny. Well, they're funny Germans. And those are the ones in Heidelberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the funny Germans. But the Czechs have always made better beer. Now, um, the, uh, some beer stories. These are my personal beer stories. Number one, a story with beer in Dallas. A German brewer uh, in Germany in 1900 by the name of Adolphus Busch left Germany. He'd stolen a beer recipe from the Czechs. Now, this beer recipe uh, was uh, from the Czechs, and the Czechs had named this beer after one of the old Bohemian kings, King Budweis. King Budweis. This is his favorite beer in the Czech Republic. Uh, Czechoslovakia, as it was then, Bohemia, actually, in 1900, when Adolphus Bush stole this recipe from the Bohemians, from the Czechs, came to the United States, 1900, went to St. Louis, married Lily Anhauser. We've got Anhauser Bush. He waters that recipe down so he can make more money and names it King Budweis. Budweiser, the king of beers. Now he comes to Dallas and uh, to see if Dallas, this is, this is over 100 years ago, comes to Dallas and um, to see if Dallas likes Budweiser. They do. He stays and builds a hotel, which he names after himself, the Adolphus Hotel. Now, the Czechs all this time did not know this was happening in the United States. Well, when they finally got out from behind the Iron Curtain, they realized everybody in America was drinking a Bud. So the Czech Republic sued Anheuser Busch and won the case. Budweiser cannot be sold in the Czech Republic. Now that didn't bother them at all because they make enough the first day of the State Fair of Texas, which we can't have this year, but that's beside the point. But <laughs> Budweiser does not have to sell beer in the Czech Republic to make money. But there's a little addition, caveat, to that uh, ruling, to the end of that case. Yes, uh, you can't sell beer, Budweiser, in the Czech Republic, and you've got to make a beer from using that original recipe. You can't water it down anymore. You can water Budweiser, but you've got to make another beer of the original recipe, and they have, and it's called Czech. Bar, C Z E K V A R, and you can get it at uh, Central Market. Uh, see, I'm a Baptist, and I'm bringing all this information to you. Lord, forgive me, but you can get it at C Central Market. <laughs> and my beer drinking friends tell me that that's the best beer of all times. Check for during times of prohibition, the 18th Amendment, which shut all the bars down, uh, no alcohol could be served. There was uh, the bathtub brew that evolved. A lot of people made beer at home. My mother loved to tell this story. Their neighbor, Mr. Andrews, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews lived next door to my mother and father. In the 20s, they were, my, they were all young. Uh, Andrews, eventually, uh, you Woodrow Wilson people, that's Bunny and Billy Andrews. I just threw that in for Woodrow Wilson. And um, then I was born. Uh, that's to my parents and the Andrews. But in the 20s, they didn't have children. And Mr. Andrews decided to make beer. And he brought a bottle of beer, his brew, to my father. 
And they all lived in what is now Lower Greenville in that area. There were houses there. And um, mother said, here comes Mr. Andrews with a bottle of beer. And my mother said, now you're not going to drink that beer, Daddy. And uh, no, I'm not. And he opened the bottle and poured it down the sink. Now those people in Lower Greenville that were living there in the 1920s were having trouble with the sewerage line. It was plugged, stopped up. Mother said when Mr. Andrews' beer went through that sewerage, it unstopped the entire sur sewerage <laughs> in Lower Greenville. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, and your beer. Now my husband, the Baptist to the bone, he never drank unless it was free. If someone would hand Jack Rumbley a drink and he didn't have to pay for it, he might drink it. Now, he was at a party. He played in the symphony. And there was a party after the symphony. And at the party was the party girl, Bobby Wygant. Remember Bobby Wygant? She was always there with her little notebook and a camera. And, for, and by the way, she's 92 years old and has just written a book. It's all about her life and all the people she interviewed. And she was there at the party. Well, somebody handed Jack Rumbley a can of beer and someone jarred him and he dumped that entire can of beer on Bobby Wygant. I went to her signing here in Dallas and I said, I'm Rosemary Rumbley. She said, oh, your husband dumped beer on me. We had never <laughs> forgotten that. The, uh, those are my beer stories, and I'm sticking with them. Beer. Starting in Egypt, in those very barns that God had commanded Joseph to make. It's really scriptural. Now we'll go to wine. Wine is old fermentation of the grape. In fact, the book said Noah probably had a glass of wine or two on the ark. All those animals would be a little bothersome. But that's an old, old, that fermentation of the grape, uh, the wine. And we know the first miracle Christ ever performed, ever, his first miracle was that of turning water into wine at the wedding. So wine's been with us forever and ever. They really do not know how it started. But the Greeks loved it. And the Greeks had a god, Dionysus, Dionysus, the god of wine. And um, they loved, they were big winos, the Greeks. And Alexander the Great uh, was, a, was an alcoholic. And he died of cirrhosis of the liver. Alexander the Great, the great Greek, greatest Greek of all times. So they were drinking quite a bit. And then when Greece fell, the Romans, to the god of wine, Dionysus, they kept that god of wine, of the vineyards. And of course, wine then went, well, throughout Europe. Uh, but it, turn, it just was to be that those vineyards were the, the flourishing, beautiful, producing vineyards were in France. And the French, oh, see, they're all associated always with the French wine, oh, the wine, the wine, oh, Marie, the wine in France. And always French wine, the most, very most uh, expensive French wine. But but it has a connection to Texas. Now, Texas has a lot of wineries now. Uh, in fact, the worse the soil, uh, the more vineyards in Texas. That rocky um, soil there in Meridian, uh, Heiko, uh, Clifton, they've got a bunch of wineries there. And then out in Lubbock, uh, West Texas, dry, horrible land. Oh, they produce these grapes. The wineries are everywhere down near Austin and New Braunfels and all there's wineries. Uh, there's wineries in near Wichita Falls, um, uh, Bowie, Montague County. There's vineyards all over Texas. Well, in the 1800s, uh, there was a wine man in Texas, in Denison, 
I started off with Denison. I'm back in Denison. His name was T.V. Munson. They have a street in Denison named Munson Avenue. T.V. Munson. In fact, when you drive to Denison, there'll be a sign that says, Welcome to Denison, Sister City, Cognac, France. Why? Well, in the 1800s, there was a blight um, of, of disease, uh, growth on the vineyards in France. They were going to lose their vineyards in France. We're losing them. They're dying. We're going to lose our wine industry. T.V. Munson, who had this lab, laboratory in Denison, with these Texas grapes, went to France with some roots from his Texas grapes, got to France, grafted those roots together, and saved the vineyards of France. T.V. Munson. They've got a T.V. Munson laboratory there. Uh, you can buy, now you see, you, they don't sell wine, but they'll sell you uh, the, 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 the vine. They'll sell you vines that you too can have your own vineyard. There's so many, so many of them. My son lives in Tyler, and he plays on weekends at Los Pinos Vineyards, and that is in... Um, um, well, wherever, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Texas, wherever Bo Pilgrim was with his chickens. Uh, they also have vineyards there in um, uh, Los Pinos. And um, on Friday nights they have a party and they have their own wine. That's their own winery. They have their own grape. They, oh, the, the vineyards are there. Sometimes you buy, you can buy the makings to make, fine, to make wine. My son-in-law makes wine. He makes wine. I'm sorry, Baptist. Uh, <laughs> I've got a Baptist son-in-law that, that makes wine and a, and a husband that used to only drink if it was free. I'm confessing all this drink. I'm not saying a word about myself, except when I taught at Dallas Baptist. If someone offered me wine, I suggested they put it in a paper cup. Nevertheless, wine, beer, wine, spirits. Oh, spirits. Where did they come from? Well, they said there was a couple of spirits in Egypt, makings, I should say, the makings of some spirits in Egypt. But the real spirits came by accident. Where else? Oh, nowhere else, nowhere else, but in Ireland, in Ireland. Oh, the Irish. Oh, the Irish. Oh, the fine Irish. I had a friend that went to... Uh, Ireland, Dublin said, this is the greatest city in the world. On every corner, there's a church and a pub. And there is. Oh, the Irish. My mother was born in Dallas in 1894. 1894, my mother was born in Dallas. Her father came as an immigrant from Germany to Dallas, opened a bakery, and mother was born over the bakery. The living quarters were over the bakery on Main Street. The, the bakery was across the street from the uh, courthouse. Mother grew up downtown Dallas. And she always said, now in downtown Dallas, and this was so true, all the Greeks had restaurants. All the Italians had grocery stores. All the Germans had bakeries. All the Irish had saloons. And that's true. There was a saloon on every corner. I have just finished writing the history of the First Baptist Church, downtown Dallas. It was 150 years old in 2018, 150 years old. And I tell the story of George W. Truett. And he came to Dallas to get rid of all the sin in Dallas, Dr. Truett. And he started first, he got rid of the red light district. Then he got rid of alcohol, the 18th Amendment. And then uh, he got rid of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he got rid of alcohol, and he got rid of the red, light, the red light district. He accomplished what he wanted to do. I'm way off the subject. Let's get back to the spirits in, in, uh, in uh, Ireland. Now, 
the Irish. They were very muchly behind as far as culture and uh, education and knowledge and all uh, because they were on that island. That was just a bunch of barbarians over on that island. Uh, and um, the Roman Empire owned and operated all of Europe. Don't you care anything about those people on that island? Nah, they're a bunch of barbarians. Who cares about them? Uh, they came from Romania, mainly. But they, we, that, they don't really know where the Irish, the Celtic, they were Celtic people, and they developed somehow on that island, and they just left them on there, just let them stay there. See, that's why St. Patrick was so loved, because St. Patrick was called by God, 500 A.D., to go to that island. See, he'd been captured by some Irish, and he prayed that they'd let him go, and they did. And then he thought, they're barbarians. I've got to go over and civilize them. And he went over to Ireland and brought the gospel message, taught them to read and write, and uh, they, they adored Patrick, St. Patrick. Now these barbarians, they raised grain. They ate, of course. And they raised barley and rye. Now they had to store... Like the, uh, like the Egyptians stored their wheat in barns, these barbarians stored their, rye, their barley and their rye in hollow logs. Now, if, that, if those logs, that barley and that rye, if that got wet in those, log, in those hollow logs, if that grain got wet, it fermented, and they couldn't use it to make bread. So they dumped it and gave it to the pigs. And then they began to notice these pigs. They were happy and playful. <laughs> and they were having such a good time. And they thought, hmm, fermented rye and barley. And they came up with spirits. And they too <laughs> frolicked and had, had, a lot, had a lot of joyous uh, moments of uh, happiness with these spirits. Now you're going to go out and say that I said alcoholics have a good time. That is not true. Alcoholism is a terrible thing. I am not promoting alcoholism. No, but alcohol has been known to make people happy. And the Irish were happier than anyone else in the world because they had these spirits. Then we, they called it Ashki. They called it Ashki. Now that's a Gaelic word, Ashki, which became in English, whiskey. Now meanwhile, in Scotland, they weren't that civilized either. And they came up with the same uh, fermentation of the barley and the rye. And they made, the Scots <laughs> made what was called scotch. And that was much finer. It was a little better alcohol, the scotch. And eventually, of course, spirits were transferred all over the world. Now let's come to America and uh, see what's happening in America. Now the uh, people in the first settlers in Virginia. Now in Texas, uh, we, we, the, Texas 1517, uh, the Spanish came. I don't know what they were drinking. I, we're, I, they, they didn't mention that in the book. I guess they, I don't know. Maybe they had some wine. I'm sure they had wine and beer. Who knows? But uh, in Jamestown, that's the first settlement, King James sent that bunch over uh, Jamestown 1607, and they got to Jamestown. It was so cold, and they were so hungry. When the ship went back, they said, bring us something to drink. <laughs> well, the next ship that came, the sailors all drank everything, so they didn't get drink. The third time, they got a little alcohol to cheer them up. That's the Jamestown bunch. Now, the pilgrims, oh, no alcohol. That's Plymouth Rock. And then the Puritans, Massachusetts, oh, they were pure. They were pure. The Puritans were pure. 
They believed if you were having a good time, you were sinning. See, the Baptists lean in that direction, and that's why all of you Methodists have such a good time. So, uh, the uh, Puritan, no alcohol. Mm -hmm. Well, time went on, and alcohol, of course, was brought in. Now, we've got a cheaper drink that was discovered in a very odd, or was made in a very odd way. Columbus landed in the Bahamas, and so the Spanish were in the Bahamas, and they discovered something in the Bahamas they'd never, never experienced before, tasted or any, oh, sugar. See that sugar cane? That's in the Bahamas. And um, the Spanish knew that it would sell well in Europe, so they actually uh, they, they destroyed the uh, natives, killed them all in harvesting that sugar. Keep working, keep working. We need this sugar. They want it in Europe. And they destroyed those native natives of the Bahamas, and that's when they began to import slaves from, Al uh, from Africa to the Bahamas. It's very hard to harvest sugar cane. And sometimes they would, not sometimes, many times, they would leave the rinds of that sugar cane there on the coastline, which fermented and made a very unusual drink they called rum. And the pirates loved it. And that's where we get this ho, 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 and a bottle of rum. And rum was a cheap alcohol, a cheap spirit, much cheaper than um, uh, scotch, are whiskey. So the scotch, the whiskey, the rum, the beer, the wine, all of this eventually came to America. Now, the first still in America, the first ones to make alcohol in America. Now they're they're making they're making wine because the grapes are there. They're making uh, wine perhaps a little beer, but as far as the whiskey and the scotch, that was first made by those Irish and the Scots that lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. See, <laughs> the eastern part of Pennsylvania, that's Philadelphia, ah, the Quakers, they were very religious, very spiritual. Uh, William Penn and the Quakers. See, they loved God so much they quaked, and they were Quakers. On the other side of Pennsylvania, hey, we got the Irish again, and the Scots, and they're making whiskey. And so it was, in the original Constitution and in the laws of America, if you raised grain and you made bread, you didn't pay taxes. If you raised grain and you made alcohol, you paid taxes. George Washington was living in Philadelphia. That was the second capital. The first capital was in uh, New York City. Then they moved the president to Philadelphia. And then, of course, Washington uh, was built after George Washington was gone. J uh, John Adams moved into the White House, Washington, D.C. So Philadelphia was the capital, and there was the president. President, do you know that that bunch of Scots and Irish, they're over there making whiskey, and they're not paying taxes? George Washington got on his horse. This was called the Whiskey Rebellion. He got in, on his horse, rode all the way to Pittsburgh, and said, you must pay your taxes. And they said, oh, we will. And they moved to Kentucky where all those stills still are working. <laughs> now, Johnny App Appleseed, he did a great thing. See that apple cider? See that? Uh, let that, those apples ferment. You've got kind of a good drink there going in America. And uh, so people were enjoying the beer, the wine, the spirits, the uh, scotch, and uh, the whiskey in America. Now let's go to Ethiopia. Now there were two 
beautiful, well, they were beautiful countries all in Africa, but the two Christian countries that were way advanced and um, civilized, I should, uh, more civilized, put it that way, the countries that flourished in Africa were Egypt. See, Egypt, always, Pharaoh, they had beer, they had the children of Israel, they, Egypt, and then Ethiopia. Because remember, F Philip the Evangelist met the Ethiopian, uh, preached the gospel to him. Can I be baptized? Yes. And the Ethiopian went back to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia became Christian. It still is. Uh, many, many Christians in Ethiopia and Christians in Egypt. Now these Ethiopians kept goats and they were on a goat farm. And there was a little vine growing on a fence in Ethiopia. And it had little beans on it. And these goats would eat those little ba beans. And they would be frisky and woo-hoo, were happy little goats. And the Ethiopians said, what are those beans? Let's see about them. And they ground them up and had this drink. And that's coffee coffee beans, first in Ethiopia. Now, eventually the coffee was r raised in Brazil and then in Java, see, but that took years to grow coffee elsewhere, but coffee started in Ethiopia. Now, coffee took Europe by storm. The Europeans loved coffee and they had these coffee houses. They had coffee houses all over Europe, but the ones that really loved it were the Germans. Oh, the Jack und der Welvi at the coffee house, yeah. And Bach, like in Johann Sebastian Bach, wrote a cantata, a cantata to coffee. And um, the, uh, the German population began to drop because the men loved those coffee houses so much, they didn't go home. <laughs> and there weren't as many kids in Germany because the men were all having a good time at Ach und der Coffee House, H-O-U-S. Ach, with the coffee, yeah, we have the coffee. Ah, then we make the coffee. And I never will forget this great aunt I had. Und now come in, come in, we make the coffee. And the coffee and the donuts and it's just a great drink. And of course now we have Starbucks and it's just a special drink. You coffee drinkers know it. I've got my coffee pot already set for the morning. I'll get up in the morning, all I do is punch, punch a button. And there's ya yeah, on the cough, coffee. The Germans loved it. Now, what happened then? Well, England had coffee houses. Not as many as the Germans did, but they had coffee houses. Europe loved coffee. Meanwhile, <laughs> several thousand centuries before this, in the Ming Dynasty in China, there was a charming China, uh, Chinese princess who had a uh, uh, lovely field of greenery and uh, she was boiling some water for her water. You'd have to boil the water. And she was to drink the water, boiled it. And a leaf from one of those trees fell in that water. And this is centuries ago. And it turned that water. And she drank that water and said, wait a minute. This leaf has done wonders for this water. And she discovered what we know as tea. Now what happened, now see the tea was only in China. And when Marco Polo found the Chinese, of course he found them. That was during the days of the Crusades. The Crusaders never went east. They just always stopped there in what we call the Middle East, uh, uh, in um, the Holy Land, Israel. They'd always stop there, Palestine. They'd stop. Well, Marco Polo went further, and he runs into these Chinese people, and they're all wearing uh, 
beautiful silk robes and drinking tea. And they're so advanced, it's unbelievable. They're eating out of beautiful dishes, which are still called China. Oh, Marco Polo said, oh, they're going to love this in Europe. And he begins bring, hauling it into Europe. And uh, the, uh, uh, they, Europe went wild for the silk. Bring more silk. The Italians said, bring the worms. That's why there's Italian silk. Uh, the uh, tea in England, uh, the spices in France, they were importing that from China. And then when the, uh, uh, the, mo uh, the barbarians cut off those trails, those uh, trading uh, tra routes, cut them off, wouldn't let them through, uh, the, uh, then that's when Columbus went to Isabella and said, I'm going to sail the other way and we'll still get all of our goodies from Europe because I'm going to sail west and I'll reach the east. And... Uh, of course, then Columbus and the Bahamas, et cetera, et cetera. But the English have always loved their tea. And they loved it so much, they began to plant tea in India, a country that was owned and operated by England. And now, t today, the tea in India is much better than the tea from China. Now, the tea still comes from China, but they can make better tea, grow better tea leaves, in India. And what happened, tea replaced or came to be the drink for the ladies. All those men in the coffee houses, ladies began to have tea parties. See? Oh, and the British just love their tea. And if you've ever had an English tea, it's a whole meal. When they stop for tea, they are enjoying, oh, a whole dinner. And they f discovered if they stopped for tea, if, they're, if the people that were working in factories or wherever they were working, if they gave them a tea break, they'd work harder when they came back. And one of those tea breaks came at the Wedgwood a pottery factory. Now, old man Wedgwood was mean as the devil, and he worked his people hard. And when they had a rest whatsoever, they would rest out on the grounds of the Wedgwood factory. Well, they were pretty rough characters out there working in that factory, that pottery factory. And here comes to save their souls, John Wesley. And Wesley not only saved the souls of those workers, but he touched God, touched the soul of Mr. Wedgwood with the message of Jesus Christ. And Wedgwood created a teapot. It's called the Wesley Teapot. And it's there in that beautiful factory there in England to this day. Tea. So ladies have tea parties. The men were in the coffee houses. Uh, drink, uh, people were drinking in saloons and bars, the spirits, the booze, uh, the wine, the beer. But we have one other drink, soda pop. Joseph Priestley, he was one of the founding fathers, was a pharmacist, he was a scientist, and he created something he called carbonated water. And it was very good for anybody that had an upset stomach. Have somebody, and, and you had to buy it and with a spigot. It would have a barrel and a spigot, and you'd get your carbonated waters. He, so he invented it. He created it. And people wanted that, car, oh, I've got an upset stomach, carbonated water. It's good for you. Well, eventually, that really developed as part of medicine, a part of a drug for the drug store. And a druggist would have carbonated water for upset stomachs. Went on, and this gentleman by the name of Pendleton in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, druggist, would have this carbonated water. Hey, Doc, I've got an upset stomach, and I've also got a headache. It would also 
make your headaches go away. It, it was a relief of headache, this carbonated water. And Pendleton thought, huh, I'm going to flavor this water with the coca bean. Now that's not cocaine, it's coca. And he flavored it. And people came into that drugstore. You had to go into the drugstore. And he'd draw the carbonate and then put a teaspoon of this syrup in. And you would have this coca cola. And he was doing very well with it. But he died. And a man by the name of Asa Chandler took that business over. And he thought, this stuff needs to be bottled. And so he created a bottle that's so distinctive. Uh, you, you could never forget the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle and begin to sell it. And it, of course, it sells worldwide. It was just a total success. Coca-Cola. Everybody was drinking Coca-Cola. But the children, kids didn't drink it, see. Well, that's a whole mob of people we're missing. They need to be drinking Coca-Cola. So how did they get the kids to drink Coca-Cola? In 1931, guess who started drinking Coca-Cola? Santa Claus. And he's still drinking it, and everybody's loving Coca-Cola. Of course, in Dallas, we have Dr. Pepper, uh, a man named Charles Waite was driven out of Virginia. He was a soda jerk. And the doctor of his girl, the, the father of his girlfriend was a doctor. And he said, you're not worthy of a doctor's daughter. Get, get out of Virginia. And he goes down to Waco to the little country, little corner drugstore, creates this drink. R.H. Lazenby said, let's bottle it in Dallas. What do you want to name it? I'm going to name it after the doctor that threw me out of Virginia, Dr. Charles T. Pepper. Now that's one of the many stories. See, nobody ever writes this down, so you have to just decide which is correct. And Dr. Pepper's big in Dallas, Texas. That's a soda pop. Now one of the reasons I chose this book is because at the end it mentions a product that I knew all about because of a great aunt I had. Uh, my grandmother was one of four girls I'll quickly tell this story. I think it's kind of cute. Four girls, uh, born in Dallas, German girls. Uh, the parents came, the great-grandparents, yeah, came from Germany to Dallas. This is my mother's side. I'm, I'm not, let's not go there. Four girls. Three of them say, stayed in Dallas, one being my grandmother. And my mother said, but one went to West Texas, and she'd just always go like that. Well, the three stayed in Dallas, and one went to West Texas. That's all I ever knew about that person. Well, I wrote a book and put the pictures of my great-grandparents in the book. I said, here's the group, they, here's the two that came from Germany uh, to Dallas, and this rich, good-looking chick came up to me at the Fort Worth Women's Club, and she said, I think we're related. And I said, well, you're good-looking and rich. Yes, we are. And <laughs> why do you think? She said, because I read your book, and you have a picture of your great-grandparents in it, and those are my great-grandparents. I said, the one that went to West Texas and found, discovered oil and all. So I was taken into this rich oil family there in Fort Worth. I just threw that in. But um, anyway, this one great-aunt lived in Dallas, and she'd come over and visit. And uh, she was taking a product that was mentioned in this book because it had a lot of alcohol in it. And these cure-alls, cure-alls, they're alcohol. See, they don't sell them anymore, but they used to have all these cure-alls. It'll cure any, anything. And this cure-all that she was taken, taking, my great aunt, was mentioned in this book, Lydia Pinkham. Now, some of you will remember Lydia Pinkham. Now, you took it as, for, as a woman, <laughs> this is terrible. This is going to be the last time I'll be invited to the Rajabian series. 
it was taken by women who were going through the change. Now, I don't think they even discuss that anymore in medical school. But anyway, my mother always laughed. She said she's 75 years old and she's been through the change for years and she's still take, taking Lydia Pinkham. Why? It was alcohol. All of those cures were alcohol. And they had these medicine shows on, cover, on flatbed wagons. Come here, come here, get your cure-all right here. It'll cure anything you got, da-da-da. And they'd sell these cure-alls, and they were 100% alcohol. They've been outlawed, see. But they used to have these medicine shows. And that's all a part of the theater. It's part of theater history. And I was a theater major and majored in theater history. And one of those cure-alls was Lydia Pinkham, and it was mentioned in the book. But that got me to thinking about these medicine shows. And they, they haven't been gone for that long of a time because in 1953, there was a Lucy episode about a cure-all. And you might remember it when Lucy said, Hi, folks, I'm your Vitamina Vegemin girl. Are you listless, worn out? Do you poop out at parties? Then you need Vitamina Vegemin. And she made that commercial and they made her quit, keep, keep taking that cure-all and she gets stoned out of her mind. It's one of the funniest scenes you could get it on YouTube. Just put Vitamina Vegemin in YouTube and there'll be Lucy taking that. Well, that's the way it was. It really was. They've been outlawed, but not for that long of a time. I've always wanted to tell this story, and I'll end, it, end with this story. I was at the University of North Texas when a man by the name of Dudley J. LeBlanc of Louisiana, he created a cure-all by the name of Hadacol. Some of you might remember Hadacol. Well, I was at the University of Texas, and... Um, uh, Mr. LeBlanc decides to have a medicine show with talented college kids in it. And he comes to North Texas to audition uh, college kids for this medicine show. And I auditioned and I got a part. And I came home and I said, Mama, you'll never guess what I'm going to do this summer. I'm going to travel all over Texas in the Hadacall show. And mother said, no, you're not. You would get ruined. So I didn't get to go. They left without me. Three years later, I get married to Jack Rumbley, the drummer. And <laughs> we were discussing something one time. We were married. And he said, you know, one of the funniest summers I ever spent was when I traveled with the head call show as the drummer. And I said, well, I could have been with them. I got a part, but my mother said I'd get ruined, so I didn't get to go. And we laughed. That was the end of that. Years go by. I mean, years. And this lady in uh, Amarillo invited me to come and speak to her woman's club. I said, sure. She said, my husband will pick you up at the airport, Southwest Airlines, fly to Amarillo. This gentleman picked me up. We're seated, seated in the car. I've got to say something to him. I talk all the time. I said, oh, you're in West Texas. I bet you went to West Texas State. No, I went to North Texas State. North, Te well, I went to North Texas State, yes. And um, uh, he said, oh, I love North Texas. One of the greatest summers I ever spent was I was in the Hadacall show, and we traveled all over Texas. I said, I'm Rosemary Rumbly, Jack Rumbly. Oh, Jack, oh, we had such a good time. Your husband, the drummer, oh, oh, and he raved about what a good time the Hadacall show had. And I said, now, see, I could have been with you, but I couldn't go because my mother said I would get ruined. And he laughed and said, Rosemary, I was with that show all summer, and I can guarantee you not one girl was ruined. Isn't that a great story? I'm not advocating drinking, but it has a great history. Bye. 
Well, of course, like we always know, a review of Rosemary Rumley's is like no other, and, and tonight was no different. Uh, we were glad that you were here to watch. We're certainly glad we had Rosemary. Uh, and uh, all I'm hoping for now is everybody has a great rest of the summer and that next year we are doing this in person. But who knows what next year is going to bring. We will be somewhere. And whether that's at Wesley Hall or whether that's someplace else, you will certainly see us. So everybody take care. Have a great uh, August, and uh, we will see you soon.